Well, um, welcome everyone to another talk in our Quantum Gravity Across Approaches series. Today, we've got Julia Gubitosi from the University of Naples and Nicolaus Mavromatos from King's College London and the Technical University of Athens. Both of them are part of the cost action on um, quantum gravity in the multi-messenger approach. And um, we're very happy to have them here. And I'm very excited because in our pre-talk, it sounded like they know exactly what they want to tell us and um, how they get to go about it. So without much further ado, we will start with Julia on Planck scale deformations of relativistic symmetries. Thank you, Lisa, for the, for the introduction. And thank you to also Sebastian, Sebastian and Aaron for organizing this. I'm very happy to begin a talk here. And uh, good evening or good morning to everyone, depending on where you are connecting from. Uh, let me share, start sharing screen. As usual, I forgot, you can ask questions in the chat or in the Slack channel. Um, just ask in chat or Slack. I will forward the question to the speakers or tell you to unmute yourself to ask it out loud. Just Okay, so um, uh, I guess I can start, right? We are. Uh, yes. Um, okay, so before I actually go to my talk, let me, you mentioned this uh, cost action uh, we are part of with Nick. So let me briefly um, say a couple of words about it. Uh, so this is an action, a European funded uh, action that's meant to facilitate networking between people working on different uh, fields and in particular, this action is uh, aimed at uh, doing quantum gravity phenomenology with the multi-messenger astrophysics. And as you can see, we have, uh, do you see my cursor? Probably not, I don't see it. Um, we have different uh, working groups, uh, some more oriented towards theory and some more oriented towards uh, actual experiments. And this comprises uh, around uh, 300 scientists from all over Europe and, also some other countries uh, in the world. So it's um, quite a large <laughs> collaboration. Um, here are just a few references if you want to know more. There is the web page, uh, Facebook page, Twitter. I think we also have Instagram now, so you can just go there and, uh, and explore. And uh, we are very happy because last week we finally managed to put out this uh, large review uh, that is meant to give a state of, of the art account of uh, the of quantum gravity phenomenology with multi messenger astrophysics. So this is uh, meant to be the starting point for people who are interested in the topic and want to get working on it. Uh, here you have the archive, uh, the archive reference, and uh, well, you can go there and uh, have a look at it. So now let's go to the to the actual talk. And um, so what, when uh, we do quantum gravity phenomenology, our hope is to try and understand a bit more about uh, what are the properties of the space time at the Planck scale, that, 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 would, be, uh, that would be good. And uh, so in the audience, we have many approaches uh, to quantum gravity. And uh, as you well know, uh, any of them has a different uh, idea about uh, how space time should look like at the Planck scale. And uh, uh, I find a ni nice way to summarize uh, this, which is <laughs> this one, that is just, uh, this is uh, some artist from New York actually, who has done work on uh, quantum space time. And this is what, uh, this is the summary <laughs> the artist found <laughs> to best fit uh, what is the status at the moment. But uh, more seriously here, uh, there is a non-exhaustive account on how, some of the approaches uh, treat uh, space time, and uh, this goes from having some kind of quantum space time to have uh, just usual quantum field theory on a fixed space time to having non commutative space time or even uh, losing locality uh, in space time. So, you really have many, many different uh, options. And uh, so, the, the question is uh, how do we approach this? How can we try and test? some of the properties of space time. And the one uh, uh, quite obvious thing actually is uh, to test what the symmetries of space time are. 
Um, this is uh, something that, uh, um, as we will see, has been uh, investigated quite a lot. And um, in this case, uh, things are a bit easier than just talking about generic properties of space-time because fundamentally at the moment we have uh, three options. Uh, so one is that uh, um, quantum gravity, th uh, the theory of quantum gravity should preserve Lorentz invariance as uh, we know it uh, at our scales. So that's the easiest uh, part. Um, other models uh, predict that we should have a breakdown of Lorentz invariance. Uh, in this case, uh, you lose re the relativity of inertial frames, so you have a preferred frame. And finally, the third option is that uh, you do not have the usual Lorentz invariance, but you still have a relativistic theory, but the Lorentz transformations are the form. This is the known as the formed uh, special relativity or DSR um, uh, theories. And uh, what I'm going to point out in the first part of my talk is that, uh, uh, well, I will mostly focus on the second and the third options because the first one, uh, there's, I mean, it's uh, trivial. And um, uh, what I'm going to do in the first part of the talk is to emphasize that uh, these two options have uh, quite different uh, uh, observational signatures. So, and uh, in some cases they might seem to predict similar things, but then uh, when you look at, to go at them better, then uh, the other, the, the, all the framework is different. So you, you will have a, a way to uh, disentangle the two options. Uh, and then in the second part of my talk, I'm going to, um, so then uh, I, in the second part, I'm going to go a bit uh, more in detail about the DSR case showing a specific model for DSR. And then uh, Nick in his talk will focus more on the leave uh, side. So I, I won't uh, do much about, um, about that. Um, so uh, just because this is an important difference, let, let me say once more how Lorentz breaking and Lorentz deforming uh, models uh, differ. So in Lorentz breaking models, uh, what happens that uh, the way you relate one observer to the other is the usual. So you relate them by uh, Lorentz transformations. Uh, but then you have some background fields, for example, and uh, these background fields introduce a preferred frame. And uh, in this way, the, sim the uh, relativistic symmetries are broken explicitly. Uh, what happens with the Lorentz uh, deformations is that uh, you modify the Lorentz group. Usually, it becomes uh, nonlinear, as you can see here at the bottom. For some reason, I cannot show the cursor. At the bottom of the slide, you see that uh, it would have a nonlinear action on, uh, on the momenta, for example. And this is deformed in, in, in such a way to allow for a, a new relativistically invariant uh, scale besides the speed of light. Uh, this scale can be thought about as the, for example, the Planck energy scale. So this theory is relativistic in the sense that all inertial observers agree on what the physics is. They all see the same kind of physics. Um, you might have apparent violations um, of uh, Lorentz symmetries just because you might be interpreting them in the framework of standard uh, uh, special relativity while you should interpret them uh, in the framework of the formed uh, relativity. But if you do that correctly, then you wouldn't see any um, preferred frame effect. And the, here I'm just showing you, for example, you have if you have a modified dispersion relation for uh, particles, these of course would be not Lorentz invariant under the Lorentz uh, standard Lorentz transformations, but if you apply this nonlinear transformation, then all observers would agree on the form of the dispersion relation. Um, so let's go and look at, uh, I'm going to look at two case studies to better emphasize the differences between the two frameworks. Um, so the first one is uh, um, the implications in the two cases for, for example, time delays of uh, photons with different energies. Um, so let us assume just for the sake of the argument that we are able to state experimentally that uh, the time of arrival of uh, photons with uh, different energies that were emitted simultaneously by some faraway source, um, uh, that their travel time is different. And uh, so the realization that uh, this kind of effect generated at the Planck scale could be within the reach of uh, experimental sensitivity dates back already to a while ago. Uh, so in particular, 1998, and was put forward by this uh, very nice paper by 
eh, Giovanni Amelino Camellia, John Ellis, uh, Nick Mavromatos, who, who is here, uh, Nanopoulos and Sarkar. And uh, this, this idea uh, now has evolved into quite an active research field. And you can see here how many papers are coming out. Uh, this is just for um, the last uh, 10 years uh, or so. This is just a, a small selection of them. And in particular, you can see that we are not only looking at uh, photons at the moment, but also neutrinos. So we are really going towards the, the multi-messenger analysis. Anyways, let, of course, at the moment, we do not have uh, a detection of uh, energy dependent time of arrival. Otherwise, <laughs> you would have heard about it. Uh, but anyways, let us assume that uh, at some point we, we might have a, a detection. And uh, here, just uh, to be a bit provocative, let me put up this plot uh, uh, from this paper from 2017, where the time of arrival of different, uh, where, where the time, uh, where GRBs, so gamma ray bursts were studied uh, uh, from this point of view. And th there were some indication that something could be there, even with some uh, tentative uh, estimate of the parameter of, uh, of the effect. So the formula that I'm showing here is uh, what you would have in the flat space limit. Then of course you have to generalize it to curve space and so on. This is just, I'm just going to make uh, an, a simplified version of the argument. And of course, let me emphasize that uh, coming to robustly determine that there is uh, an energy dependence in the speed of propagation of photons is not trivial at all. I mean, it's not that you just put uh, points in a plot like this. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a starting point, but then you would need to account uh, for all sorts of complications from the astrophysical point of view, uh, observational point of view, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, actually you can also do similar kind of analysis putting together photons and uh, neutrinos. And this is also quite intriguing at the moment, but as I said, nothing conclusive. Um, so if we saw such a, an energy dependent um, uh, travel time for photons, uh, then uh, we, we would uh, start making a series of deductions uh, from that, to, from there to see what the theoretical implications are. So first of all, by uh, immediately we would say, okay, this depends on some energy dependent uh, speed of propagation and uh, upon some assumptions such as that the velocity is still uh, written uh, in the usual way uh, as in a Hamiltonian theory, then uh, this can be uh, traced back to some modified uh, dispersion relation uh, for massless particles of the kind that I'm writing here um, at the bottom. And uh, if I take this modified dispersion relation, as I said before, this can be either associated to Lorentz breaking or Lorentz deforming theories. So that we, 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 if we only had this observation, we would have no way to disentangle um, the two effects. But in fact, uh, if we go beyond this, then we see that uh, uh, the two scenarios are completely different. So for example, if we are in a Lorentz breaking scenario, then even if we have a modified uh, dispersion relation, then we would not expect uh, uh, to have modification in other features of, uh, uh, of the particles. For example, we, we would not expect that uh, the laws of conservation of energy and momentum would be modified, uh, especially if we embed the, the, the Lorentz breaking scenario into uh, some effective field theory uh, framework. Uh, this means if we put together the dispersion relation that is modified and the uh, composition law that are not modified, this means that, for example, we have strong implication for threshold reactions. And in particular, we would uh, allow for uh, photon decay in vacuum. So this is quite a, a big effect and uh, is strongly constrained at the moment. It's something that we, we do not see. So if we saw a modified dispersion relation from the time delay and uh, we, uh, then we, and we wanted to test the Lorentz breaking scenario, then we would go and see how that compares to the limits coming from uh, uh, threshold reactions, for example. Um, uh, moreover, if we actually want to embed the Lorentz breaking scenario into an effective field theory model, and this uh, is going to be explained very nicely by Nick, um, uh, we, we have some constraints uh, such that the dispersion relation would need to be modified with different opposite signs for the two helicities of the photons. And this implies that photons would, would see by refringence if they are polarized. This means that the, the direction of the polarization of uh, radiation rotates during propagation. And this can be tested either with astrophysical sources or 
uh, even looking at even further sources with the cosmic microwave background. And this is something I've been working on uh, for a while, especially in the past. And uh, you actually have strong constraints on this. So also this would need to be taken into account if you wanted to actually uh, make a, a statement about Lorentz breaking, given that you had observed some modified dispersion relation um, thing. Um, uh, what would happen uh, on the other hand in the in the DSR uh, scenario? Uh, here, if you have a modified dispersion dispersion relation, uh, and if you do not want to uh, introduce the prefer intru to introduce a preferred frame, then you need to modify the Lorentz transformations between different frames. Otherwise, you would, you would not see always the same form of the dispersion relation in any reference frame. And as I said before, this means that the boost transformations, for example, act nonlinearly on energy momentum. And in turn, this requires that also the law of conservation in interaction, so the, 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 the way energy moment are conserved in interaction, has to be modified to, in order to be, co to be covariant in the correct way under these deformed transformations. And what happens is that if you put together this deformed uh, conservation of energy momentum with the modified dispersion relation, then you get that in fact, uh, you would not expect such large effects, for example, on the threshold reactions I talked about before. And in particular, the reactions that are forbidden in special relativity because they would introduce a preferred frame if they happen, such as photon decay in vacuum, they would also introduce a preferred frame in DSR, and this would, would be against, <laughs> uh, it would not be allowed within a relativistic theory. So you would just not expect that kind of effects. Uh, things become a bit more complicated at uh, a dynamical level because in the leaf case, uh, we have a defective field theory, so we can also work out the dynamics and Nick will show that later. Uh, in DSR, that's still uh, not available. So at the dynamical level, we cannot still make statements uh, that are so clear, at least in the, on the DSR side. Um, another uh, case study uh, that I think is interesting, this is, uh, not about, uh, modi uh, this is not about modified dispersion relation or time delays. It's a completely different uh, setting and is uh, synchrotron radiation. Um, but I, I think it makes even uh, more clear the, how these two theories are different and how the, the different way you connect observers in the two theories uh, uh, is important. Um, so within, uh, within LIV uh, models, uh, um, so let, let, we want to look at uh, synchrotron radiation for electrons in, uh, let's say, well, this work uh, was done for electrons in uh, in LEP, but you could do it LHC or whatever. Um, so um, again, let us assume that we have a Lorentz uh, breaking model such that the energy uh, momentum dispersion relation for electrons is modified with this delta parameter that you see at the top uh, left. This means that uh, the gamma factor, or you can also think about the rapidity, that links the rest frame of the electron to the frame of the laboratory where the electron has the observed energy is uh, different from what you would expect in special relativity. And you see that it has uh, a correction that goes with the delta gamma square. So um, this is important because you see that the correction is amplified by a gamma square factor. And in particular, if we look at the uh, radiative power of the, uh, the synchrotron radiative power, uh, you compare what you would have in special relativity to what you would have in uh, Lorentz breaking scenario, and you see that the correction term is there. It's a gamma square delta delta factor, and this gamma square factor, for, let's say for an electron of uh, around 90 GeV, it's a large amplification factor. Is this uh, 10 to the 10? I wish I could point, but uh, I don't see my cursor. Okay, well. Um, so this uh, gamma square factor is 10 to the 10. And uh, so from the constraint on uh, that, uh, the, that you actually see the radiated power that you would expect in special relativity up to a factor 10 to the minus four, you get a constraint on this delta parameter. So on the correction term in the modified dispersion relation that is 10 to the minus 15. So it is a very, very strong constraint that would bring you to say, okay, there is no such effect uh, uh, there. What happens in, uh, in the SR models? 
it, it happens that the bound you can put is much, much weaker. And the, why does this happen? Uh, it happens because you still have the modified dispersion relation. Um, this is uh, one of the simplest ones you could think about. But if you put this together with the, the formed form of the boosts that now link the rest frame of the electron to the laboratory frame, you get that the gamma factor uh, now uh, in the SR is different from the gamma factor of special relativity, but does not have a large correction term. In fact, it has a correction term that uh, basically is just uh, E over uh, the mass where the effect uh, takes place. So is F, is, it is as if in the lead case, you only had the delta and not the amplification factor gamma. And uh, this implies that the kind of constraint that you can put is actually of the same order as the uh, difference uh, between, uh, uh, it is of the same order as the constraint you put on the uh, radiated synchrotron power. So it's just 10 to the minus four. And uh, in turn, this implies that your M star, which would be the quantum gravity scale, so the scale where the effect uh, would become important, is, is uh, constrained to be uh, more than the PV scale, which is not impressive at all. It's <laughs> far away from, uh, from the quantum gravity scale. So I, I think this is a very nice uh, example where, where you see how the predictions uh, and the kinds of constraint that you could, can put in the two frameworks uh, um, uh, differ. Um, so uh, now that I, I think I made this point, let me go to uh, give you a concrete example of DSR. I think I still have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, is that right? Time 15 minutes? Yes. Five to 10 minutes? Okay, I let's think. Okay, okay. Um, so in this concrete model that I want to consider, uh, I'm going to put myself in a specific uh, limit of quantum gravity, which is uh, a limit uh, that is uh, where h bar and g are going to zero, but their ratio is constant. This means uh, that uh, we do have a, uh, an energy scale, but not a length scale. So we are going from quantum gravity towards special relativity along the red arrow that uh, I draw in this, uh, in this cube. And uh, if we are in this limit, then it is, uh, because we have an energy scale, it is natural to look at our theories from the point of view of momentum space. And uh, also, uh, this energy scale allows us, uh, gives us the scale that we need to deform the Poincare algebra. So it gives us the scale that we need to build the DSR uh, model. And let me just briefly mention that uh, these kind of deformations that uh, I'm talking about, um, I'm going to talk about them as a, a realized in quantum groups or, or of algebra uh, in the framework, which is a very nice framework because it makes sure that, uh, that, that you're doing everything consistently. It's not the only way to do the SR. And let me also mention briefly that, uh, so it is hard to go from the full uh, fundamental quantum gravity theories to regimes that are closer to where we can do experiments or phenomenology. But we have some indications that, for example, if you couple matter to two plus one quantum gravity, then matter would would see the formed Poincare symmetries. And we also have some indications that if we go to some Minkowski regime of loop quantum gravity and look at the hypersurface deformation algebra, then it is deformed in a way that would point towards the deformation of the Poincare group. These are just indications at the moment because making this link is hard. It would be great to do more on this. But anyways, they are, they are interesting. So let us go to the concrete model I want to talk about uh, briefly, which is known as the Kappa Poincare of algebra. As you see, it involves a nonlinear modification of the commutators of the algebra. Here, everything is in one plus one. We have the Casimir, which is where we read the modified dispersion relation from that is nonlinear and has this uh, complicated form. And then we also have a nonlinear action on products of functions. From this structure, then we can infer the properties of the momentum space of the theory. So from the co-product, we infer a deformed composition rule for, N, for the momenta. As I said, from the Casimir, we infer a modified dispersion relation that actually to the first order is of the kind I showed you before in my example. And uh, uh, for example, from this, uh, if I take the full order dispersion relation, uh, I find that, for example, for massless particles, this is how it looks like. And uh, you see that we have a maximum allowed spatial momentum while the energy can go all the way up. And uh, this maximum momentum 
exists in a rel relativistically compatible way, exactly because the uh, transformations between observers are, are deformed. And moreover, from uh, these uh, uh, properties of the momentum space, uh, it turns out that in fact, the momentum space is not flat as it is in standard uh, theory, but it is curved and in particular, it covers half of a de Sitter manifold. So we can, uh, um, all these uh, uh, non-trivial properties such as the form composition rules and the form uh, modified dispersion relation, we can see them as effects of the curvature on, on momentum space. Um, some interesting, uh, I'm going to go briefly through a couple of interesting features uh, because I see that my time uh, is, uh, is running short. Uh, so one of the features is that if you work out the word line for a massless particle within this model, you will see that uh, it actually looks uh, standard. You, you have that uh, space is just proportional to time. However, the way translations act on coordinates is non-trivial. And this is uh, such that if you compare what an observer at emission sees to what the observer at detection sees, and you properly do the, the translation between the two observers. So here I am plotting uh, uh, the world in these two plots, uh, you see the world line in blue of a low energy photon and in red of a high energy photon. From the point of view of Alice, who is the observer at mission, the two photons travel with the same velocity. So Alice would say, okay, they, 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 will, they will not see any time delay. However, if you then translate to the observer Bob that is at the detector, then what happens is that Bob will say, okay, I expect that the low energy photon will arrive at, with some, the high energy photon will arrive with some time difference with respect to the low energy photon. And then you can deduce the, the, the expected time delay that here it is written in this uh, cumbersome form, but it is just the kind of time delay that I was discussing at the very beginning of my talk. Um, a very final thing, because I mentioned the interactions. So in DSR, as I said, interactions are still at the very beginning. I mean, studies on interactions are still at the very beginning. We're still trying to understand them. Uh, let me just say that it is important to understand how they work, because for example, if we want to construct space time from the properties of the momentum space uh, that we have, uh, then we need to build a network of observers. And to do so, we need to build a network of interacting uh, particles. Uh, and, um, and, and in particular, what we see uh, here, I'm just showing that, uh, for example, uh, while in special relativity, this works uh, nicely, all observers are linked either by, by combinations of translations and boosts. If I want to do the same in the SR, uh, which is the, the bottom part of the slide, what I find is that, for example, uh, I have an issue if I want first to, to link to observer, either first translating and then boosting or vice versa, first boosting and then translating. Because the, the translation parameter that, that we link the two observer becomes momentum dependent. And then the question arises of what momentum I'm talking about. So whose momentum is this momentum that appears in the, in the transformation parameters? Uh, and uh, okay, here I will just go very briefly. Uh, to, to start understanding this, then we start to understand how interactions are covariant under this uh, deformed uh, group of symmetries. If I look at a very simple interaction where the conservation rules are, are the following, then I, of course, this is not covariant under standard boost. But what happens is that I need to boost the different particles with the rapidity that depends on the momentum of the other particles. So in order to keep the covariance of the, of the vertex. And this is... Uh, a very counterintuitive uh, fact, but uh, uh, it, it makes things uh, consistent. And uh, it can be traced back to the fact that I briefly mentioned that boosts have a non-trivial co-product. So they, have a non, no, they, they act in a non-trivial way on products of functions, or in this case, on uh, systems of composite particles. Um, this the, this is the very final point. This causes issues if I want to look at uh, interconnected interactions, such as uh, the ones that I show in this uh, diagram. Uh, uh, because, for example, if I, if I consider separately the vertex 1 and the vertex 2, then I know that uh, in order for them to be covariant, for example, the rapidity of particle k needs to depend on the, so if I look at vertex one, the rapidity of particle K needs to depend on the momentum of particle Q that, that is in that vertex. 
But then if I look at the second vertex, I know that the rapidity of particle S will need to depend on the rapidity of particle R, but also on the rapid, uh, sorry, on the momentum of particle R, but also on the momentum of particle Q. So in order to have covariance of this network of interactions, I need to know what are the momenta of all the particles involved that are causally connected to each other. And this, of course, causes a lot of <laughs> conceptual, uh, well, these are just the formulas that say, that say what I just said in words. Uh, this causes a lot of problems because if I look at one single vertex and I want to understand how that is covariant, then I would need to know what is the history of, that, of the particles that belong to that vertex. And uh, this, of course, causes, causes, I mean, brings up problems about uh, what happens to causality and the, can, can, it, does this, can this be made into a meaningful uh, model? Or, or shall I really know the history of the whole universe if I want to just study one interaction vertex? Uh, this was just to give you an idea of the kind of complexities that can emerge in this, uh, in this framework. I leave up uh, um, the conclusions. Uh, I, I won't uh, go through them in, in detail, and maybe I, I leave the stage to, to Nick if there are no urgent questions, I guess. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Are there any questions that are to Julia's talk? There will be more time for questions again after both talks and also for a discussion, but oh, okay, I'm seeing a hand raised. Uh, George, Jordan, do you want to unmute yeah. yourself and ask? Yes, yes. Hi, Julia, it was a very nice talk. Hi, hi, George. Just a, a quick question about sure. this uh, uh, going beyond effective field theory. So do you have something very concrete to say about that? Do you mean like the the coupling is violated, that you have some... Um, well, going beyond the effective field yeah. theory, I mean, as you saw, if I want to do the SR, I, I'm already going beyond locality, for example. So you would need to... Non-local, uh, uh, non would... but uh, causal... Uh... For example, and this uh, thing about the interactions, uh, might point towards the need to also look at, at some deformation of co the concept of causality somehow. So, I mean, I'm not saying that it is a, it's not a theorem, it's not that we cannot do it, but it would not be an easy effective field theory, let's say. <laughs> well, I, I don't think it is effective field theory, but okay, yeah. I just wanted to uh, pick your brains about what you meant. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Just Thank you. Thank you for the question. No problem. Okay, if there are no further questions, then um, let's move over to Nick, who will tell us about yes. anomalies, anomalies and torsion in quantum gravity and Lorentz violation in the universe. Can you see my full screen? Yes. Very good. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Lisa, the two Sebastians and Aaron, for this very nice initiative they have and the honor they, they make to me by inviting me to this very interesting back-to-back uh, -back talk with Julia. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, as Julia announced, uh, an explicit example and concrete calculation on a Lorentz violation in the universe within an effective field theory, where I will argue that it is torsion and actually it's condensate uh, computed in a weak quantum gravity theory with chan simons anomalies that could actually lead to a concrete prediction of one of the coefficients of the standard model and Lorentz violation, because there are many. Uh, however, I will also make a, 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 a conduct uh, with uh, my earlier uh, work. So the, the outline uh, is, uh, I mean, this is not the logo of the quantum gravity across approaches. This is uh, what uh, I have done by trying to show what this uh, initiative brings. Uh, for instance, these are in the case quantum fluctuations of the apple, which is classical gravity, but there are cracks in this construction of the classical gravity itself, which could come from uh, reconsidering our uh, uh, view of uh, what quantum gravity could be. Now, these are the big questions from the side of the quantum gravity across approaches. And in this particular talk, I will try to concentrate on two of them, topology and its role in, in the early universe and, and perhaps the Big Bang. 
So let me start by uh, reviewing briefly what uh, Julia has talked about. Uh, Julia has talked about uh, Lorentz uh, symmetry. She didn't talk about Lorentz symmetry violation, but she talked about the formations which can be accommodated in quantum gravity. Quantum gravity can accommodate both or none of them. Uh, and uh, our phenomenological approach, as uh, Julia said, is also considered in this uh, recent uh, work. Here is what uh, Julia concentrated mostly. This is an animated thing of the time delays, the higher energy photons uh, represented by the, the wavelength, by red wavelength, arrive later. Of course, this was supposed to be superimposed uh, to each other. If quantum gravity is subluminal, they could be by the fringes effects. If they are superluminal, in some versions of uh, this phenomenon in non critical strings theory, it's always subluminal and there is no by fringes. However, in this phenomenon, there are also very interesting effects, which are due to gravitational wave propagation. If gravitational waves propagate in a space time form, then their propagation will be affected. Here, I was deliberately choosing not to cover the entire space because uh, motivated by some mod concrete models of uh, string form in which the string theory form is represented by space-time defects in brain worlds, you may have uh, inhomogeneous uh, uh, fluctuations, but never mind about that. This is what Julia has talked about briefly. And of course, in, this can happen in both Lorentz symmetry violation and the formation, but Julia explained the differences. I must say here that if you have such relations, you may also arrive at Finsler geometries because you may replace the momentum operator in a quantum setting with a gradient, and eventually you will end up with a higher derivative uh, Finsler uh, type uh, geometry where the metal could depend on both the space time and, uh, and momentum. Now, uh, here I'm going to concentrate most on Lorentz symmetry violation, in particular, standard model extension, which was originated by Kosteletsky. And in particular, I will concentrate on an effective field theory where Lorentz violation and CPT violation following from that uh, will appear and will characterize the early universe. The original standard model extension was developed as a low energy limit of some string theory with spontaneous Lorentz violation. And this is the kind of violations I'm going to discuss. I'm going to discuss the spontaneous violation. I hope you can see my cursor, am I right? We, we can. Yes. Okay, we can. Good. So uh, this uh, Lorentz violation is going to be spontaneous in the sense that it, it, the symmetry is violated only by the vacuum, by the ground state of the theory, but not by the Lagrangian. And that was the first uh, model that Kosteleski and Samuel have discussed. Uh, but of course, uh, it was discussed in the limit of string theory, but many string theories were not considering Lorentz violation in their landscape. They always assume as a constant, but it can be violated. In the talk, I will present another string inspired derivation of a symbol. Uh, standard model extension theory, which would come from some semi-microscopic string inspired gravitational theories, which contain both chiral anomalies and torsion. The anomalies are important, and they are consistent with general covariances I will discuss. The spontaneous violation of Lorentz symmetry will arise, as I will argue, for in the early universe from some condensation of the anomaly term, of the chern simons terms, that will be triggered by the presence of primordial gravitational waves. Why gravitational waves? Because the gravitational waves violate CP symmetry and the chern simons uh, term is sensitive to CP violations and that's why it's non-zero. chern simons theory in the Robertson-Walker universe is zero. There is no anomaly in our background of Robertson-Walker. You need CP violating perturbations in gravity and these are quantum gravity perturbations, weak quantum gravity, of course, about the city of space-time that I'm gonna consider. So I'm talking about quantum theory and how in this particular case, you get Lorentz violation. An important point is split by torsion, which as I will argue is equivalent to a, an action field. So we are in dangerous anomalous territory and you should view the torsion full quantum gravity as an ultraviolet completion of uh, some quantum gravity model in particular embedded in string theory. This is some of the works of mine, but I will concentrate on a very recent review, which I <laughs> produced immediately after the the, I mean, I was working before on our review on, uh, of the cost action. And uh, uh, this review also gives more details for people who are interested in it. So what is, first of all, the standard model extension? It's an effective local Lorentz environment and or CPD violating effective field theory framework, which uh, involves uh, terms, higher dimension operators, which are suppressed by powers of some energy scale, which is associated with these violations. Uh, the scale is supposed to be larger than, of course, any detected scale at colliders at present or in astrophysics. And uh, these operators have this generic form. 
uh, omega mu, the C mu nu could be background, could be condensates, and these are the operators of the standard model. So you start from an operator of the standard model, you give a background, and then you construct all the higher derivative operators like this. What I mean by standard model is that uh, these operators should be gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant in general, after contraction with the background tensor, they should not be reducible to lower dimension operators by the equations of motion, should not be reducible to a total derivative, of course, because you assume that uh, terms in total derivative vanish and should couple to any reducible background tensor. So that's what the standard model extension is. In fact, it's a framework, it's not a model. You write down whatever operator you can uh, think of. And of course, each one, because it violates Lorentz symmetry, uh, it makes a prediction, which of course you can test. And so far, nothing has been found. If you don't know the scale of these operators and you need to embed this in a microscopic model in order to understand the scale. And we will see the, in this example, one such situation. The standard model extension pertains to all sectors, fermion sectors, gate sectors, Higgs sector. I'm gonna concentrate on this sector and in particular on this axial term of the fermion sector. This is the simplest, which comes from torsion as we see. A torsion, as we shall discuss, uh, can lead to interactions, four fermion interactions. And uh, if you do a random phase approximation, uh, in other words, if you assume that some of them condense and then you expand, uh, you can end up with this operator where, where this Lorentz violation comes because of the condensate, because this term uh, has an index, a Lorentz index, and in a Lorentz invariant theory, it should be zero. But it could come also from a gravitational anomaly. I will say what phi is. And in this particular case, phi, in fact, corresponds to an action which corresponds to torsion, which couples to the anomaly, and, and uh, this uh, produces these sort of terms. These are the sort of terms that I will discuss in a microscopic theory, and then I will use them, surprisingly, to uh, in the early universe, and then scale them down with temperature today. And you will see that today they are negligible, but not in the early universe. But at least within this example, which I'm not saying is a physical theory, but it's, it could be. I mean, it could be an interesting theory. This shows you, this example shows you how you can calculate these coefficients. And of course, it's only one. But in this particular one, is only one. In this particular model, only one arises, this one. So as I will argue, uh, this coefficient is associated with something which is called string inspired torsion. And I will argue the following, that first of all, you have gravitational wave condensations in the early universe lead to an anomaly, gravitational anomaly, John Simon's gravity condensation, and then, there is, uh, if you like, an, an action background, which is induced by torsion, which remains constant. And that is a spontaneous violation of Lorentz symmetry. This action background is actually uh, this background uh, B dot. This would be a constant in time, in the robinson walker time. Now, of course, this route is painful because you have first to construct microscopic one of the models with strong CPD violation in the early universe, but we could today, you have to fit with all the available data. And in this way, you can estimate the matter and the matter asymmetry in the universe and today's uh, values. So the motivation for this work, apart from trying to get a microscopic uh, uh, embedding, if you like, of the standard model extension of Kosteleski into some microscopic theory comes because in today's cosmology, despite all these important discoveries, including the gravitational waves in 2015, we still don't know what is the nature of dark energy, what's the nature of dark matter, and we haven't seen primordial gravitational waves, and also we don't understand inflation in a microscopic way. For instance, is it due to inflatons or, I mean, this, this inflationary era? Uh, many models are excluded, but uh, the dynamical model by Starobinsky and other dynamical models of inflation where the inflaton field is dynamically included in the version is, uh, is not excluded. So that's one question. There is some tension in data today, uh, in the galaxy growth data and in the present era, which surprisingly could be explained, could be linked to quantum gravity, and you will see how. This is the tension, the measured value of the Hubble tension by using local measurements, Cepheids, uh, Cepheid galaxies today, and those of Planck, they are in a discrepancy. The local measurements point towards a, a Hubble constant of 72 kilometers per second per mega per sec. This is actually the astrophysicist unit of one over time. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> the number would be ugly, it wouldn't be 72 if you use one over time seconds. And this is the Planck uh, data, the CMB data. And then the growth of tension. There are also, there is also, uh, if you notice, uh, discrepancies between the Planck data and, and the lambda 
uh, CDM uh, deformations, okay? Now, what does this have to do? Also, there is one more open system which I will discuss today. And this is the microscopic matter and the matter of asymmetry in the universe. Why we see this number? Why we see one antiproton in billions of protons, in the, the nine protons? Huh? Why this is the baryon asymmetry densities and baryon anti antibaryon? So why we see this number? Uh, Zakharov pointed out uh, conditions, C bio charge violation, charge conjugation violation, CP violation in the Evelyn universe and departure from thermodynamic equilibrium. But CP violation in the quark sector of the standard model is still smaller by 20 orders of magnitude, 10 orders of magnitude less to explain the observed number. So you need new physics, you need new sources of CP violation. Zakharov assumed CPT in the early universe. Several ideas assuming CPT goes, you assume gut grand unified models, supersymmetry, extra dimensions. The simplest is you assume massive neutrinos as a source of extra CP violation. And this is called leptogenesis, which eventually then you, you have CP violating decays in the right hand neutrino into standard model particles and antiparticles. CP violation makes, despite the fact that the neutrino is the same as its own antiparticle because it's Majorana, the product is different because the decay rates are different because of the CP violation. And then you communicate this to baryon number via appropriate B minus L baryon minus lepton number process, conserving processes. In this talk, I will change this. I will change the geometry, and this is where Lorentz violation comes in. And I will claim that if you have an early Lorentz violation symmetry, uh, an early universe Lorentz violating symmetry and CPT symmetry, i.e. through some gravitational defects, which is a torsion, I consider it as a defect, then you could get uh, the CP violation, you could get this sort of leptogenesis without actually much fine tuning, uh, but you get CP and CPT together. And the CP comes from torsion. So torsion matters. This you can be interpreted either that torsion does matter or these are matters of torsion. So what is torsion? What does torsion in general and in general departure from Riemannian geometry have to do with the above considerations of the early universe of matter the matter of symmetry is the following. First of all, a quantum torsion leads to gravitational anomalies and action like excitations in any theory that contains torsion. Then I will show that condensation of anomalies which may be triggered by gravitational waves in primordial gravitational waves in the very early universe leads to spontaneous Lorentz and CPT violation and then matter and the matter asymmetry. Space time is non-standard because it's not Riemannian. There's various frameworks with torsion. Uh, Julia has uh, given a nice list on, uh, on uh, theories of quantum gravity. Almost all of them contain torsion, but not necessarily. However, some of them contain necessarily torsion. First of all, the einstein cartan theory is a low energy limit of some quantum gravity. It contains torsion because if you set the torsion to zero, you get the standard Einstein. So this contain may or may not contain torsion. What does contain torsion necessarily? Supergravity, of course, where the fermions and supergravity form torsion. Superstring theory contains torsion in the sense that uh, the, the torsion is due to a spin one and the symmetric tensor field, which exists in the fundamental massless bosonic multiplet of the string. Therefore, you cannot avoid it. You may set it to zero by hand, like most people do, but we will see that if you don't, you get interesting results. And of course, in string theory, you also have fermions and supergravity can be embedded in string theory, so also you get the fermionic torsion. And then loop quantum gravity models and spin foam models or models with uh, uh, along the lines of Lavinia, Heisenberg, and other people have been suggesting where you have the metricity scalars can contain torsion. And there, there are interesting topological invariants, particularly the Nihian invariant and non-topological invariant, but interesting terms which would vanish otherwise if torsion were not zero. The Holtz term, which are associated with the so-called barbero Mirci parameter. I, I will say what this thing is. I will concentrate on these three. And I will argue in particular that there are links. In fact, the action that I will argue that is associated with torsion, which is actually the dual of this four, of this anti-symmetric torsion spin one field in four dimensions, is related to the barbero Mirci parameter, view it as a field of the loop quantum gravity. That, that's what I will conjecture. So let me start quickly with what torsion is. Uh, torsion is this field, is the non-vanishing of the covariant derivative of the VL bind in a Palatini formalism where the spin connection is not the standard connection, uh, which satisfies the vanishing of this, but it contains the contortion. The, the, the spin connection is independent of the VL binds. 
and uh, which are defined here as the square roots of the metric. These are the inverse Weir binds. And of course, if you are in the Riemannian theory, the torsion vanishes. That's what you postulate, and you go from Einstein Cartan to Einstein. And this is the standard. That's why you get the Christoffel symbol, which is symmetric in its lower indices, and it's connected to the metric and the derivatives of the, of the metric dash. If you have a torsion, then the actually this is called the contortion, and the torsion is related to the contortion via this relation. Uh, the contortion is on the symmetric in its lower indices. And then you can define a generalized curvature to form where the Christoffel symbol, if you like, is not symmetric in its lower indices. And that defines the torsion. The interesting thing is that if you form the Einstein Hilbert uh, generalized curvature to form, uh, it can be split into the contortion, a quadratic term without derivatives on so the contortion plus a covariant derivative. This is the covariant derivative without torsion. Therefore, when you consider an action, this term drops out because it's a boundary term. And therefore, you have a non propagating torsion field. That's a generic thing in the Einstein uh, uh, Cartan theory. If you consider higher curvature terms and higher derivatives, this is no longer the case. The torsion is propagating, but these terms are suppressed. So, to lowest order, you can integra integrate the torsion exactly in a quantum bathymeter. You may not know what the quantum gravity part is, but the torsion can be. And uh, you can couple the torsion via the spin connection to the fermions as well. The spin connection couples to this quadratic uh, commutator of the gamma matrix, as you know, and therefore this, uh, the, from this property of the three uh, in tangent space, three uh, products of three gamma matrices, you can get a gamma five term here. And therefore you see that the torsion, actually it's totally anti-symmetric part because of this uh, epsilon term here, which is the Levitzivita symbol. It couples to the axial current. That's important. That's what I, I've noticed before. I told you before. So you can understand now if there is a condensate of this term, you get the, uh, you can see what you get. You get the B times the axial uh, current. Uh, and if the torsion, as we shall see, this dual term is the derivative of, of some action field, as we shall argue, you get the, the Kosteleski. That's the idea. So this is important to keep in mind that only the totally anti-symmetric part of the torsion couples to fermionic matter. Now I define it's dual in three dimensions like this, which means that's the real torsion, which is related to the contortion in the way I've said. And of course, and of course taking into account this coupling, you can easily show in form language that you get these dual couples to the axial cavern in this way. So that's a vector. Then you get this like a mass term of this s mu s mu and then you can split this totally anti-symmetric part of the torsion which is the s plus the rest of the torsion the rest of the torsion is also non-propagating in string theory you don't have this this is zero because you only have totally anti-symmetric torsion coming as we shall see from the spin one field then the fermion couples to the axial current if you replace of course this torsion on this you get the four fermion axial current uh, repulsive interactions, which is characteristic of any quantum torsion. Uh, if you use the equations of motion, on the other hand, you see that classically this is conserved. So the torsion is conserved because of this Bianchi identity. But as you know very well, when you have an axial current, because the conservation of the axial current is only classical here, you use the classical equations of motion. But in quantum physics, there are anomalies, chiral anomalies. This is the gauge sector, which could be non-abelian, and the gravitational. Sector. And of course, this coefficient depends on how many this is one, uh, one chiral fermion in the loop for clarity here, but you could have all the whatever the uh, chiral number of degrees of freedom multiplies this anomaly. And these are the dual, the, the, the twiddle here is the dual tension. This implies that the D star S is proportional to the anomaly is non-zero. So the quantum torsion is no longer conserved by loops, by one loop, actually. The anomaly is an exact at one loop. What you can do is you can implement the conservation by fiat by adding appropriate uh, renormalization group counter terms so as you remove order by order in quantum gravity these anomaly terms. And then this means that you implement in your path integral of the torsion the constraint of the conservation of the charge ds, which is the classical, uh, this is the classical uh, conservation. Eh? So you implement this Bianchi identity in the path integral. Here, I ignore the pathological of gravity. I only concentrate on the dual term and also the pathological of the rest of the non-symmetric torsion, which can be integrated exactly in the pathological because it's non-propagating. 
And you see, you already see that when I integrate out the S and I implement this constraint as a path integral with this Lagrange multiplier field as a delta functional, you get this. So you get uh, after you integrate out the K hat and the S and you normalize the kinetic term service to the, the Lagrange multiplier service to have a kinetic term, uh, canonical kinetic term, you see that you observe four fermion repulsive interactions, characteristic of any torsion, but coupling of an action like to carry an anomaly. And this is the important point. This is one property of generic of torsion. You always have this actual current current repulsive interactions, and is already noted in the context of string theory 92. And you also get a torsion induced action. So the torsion, the quantum torsion, the totally antisymmetric part of it is equivalent to an action field. There are other parts in general. So that's what is the, what I wanted to keep that a torsion, if you have quantum torsion is equivalent to an action like dynamical field theoretic degree of freedom coupled to chiral anomalies plus repulsive into parentheses for from interaction because in more general theories, you may get also attracted to parts. Now, let me continue by actually quoting Heisenberg here, where he says the part and the whole, that there is a fundamental error in separating the parts from the whole, the mistake of atomizing what should not be atomized. And you will see why I'm saying this, unity and complementarity constitute reality, because what are the parts that I'm gonna consider below and what is the whole? The first part is the stringy gravitational action, what's happening in string theory now. I tell you that torsion is associated with an action, but how we have this action in string theory, which is one theory of quantum gravity. In a massless gravitational multiple of closed strings, you have spin scalar dilatons, spin two traceless tensors, and, uh, and uh, spin one and the symmetric crank tension, which is the Calvin field. This is known to have a symmetry. I don't have time to explain. It comes from the vertex operators of closed string, which means that because of this U1 symmetry, the B mu doesn't appear in the effective action, but uh, only uh, alone, but it appears to reach field strength. This indicates higher curvature, higher derivative types of this field. Let's concentrate at the moment on this because these are all suppressed by gravitational scale or string scale. The field, there is an important point in string theory that of uh, stringy anomaly cancellation in the bulk dimension between gauge and gravitational anomalies. And that requires the modification of this field strength. It's no, no longer the curl, but it's this. These are the Chern Simons terms. These are gauge fields, and this is spin connection. Once you you observe, first of all, from what we discussed before, that this term, because it's totally antisymmetric, can play the role of a contortion. You see, remember what I told you, the contortion never actually gets any derivatives if you integrate it out. And that's what you get here. And this is the generalized connection is not symmetric. Here I set self-consistently, actually, you can show that the delay onto a constant, so as not to bother us, but the delay doesn't affect things. When you quantize distortion in the same way as uh, was done generically, this is dual to, to an action field. Why you have the Bianchi identity, this is the covariant derivative without torsion, which comes by considering D star of this, this is zero and this D star of that gives me the anomaly terms. You implement this Bianchi with a Lagrange multiplier. And now remember before I only had this vanishing. The covariant derivative of the totally antisymmetric torso was vanishing. That was the S, D star S. Here I have also this because of the anomaly. So here, although I'm in a bosonic case, I'm going to get this anomaly term. That's the Lagrange multiplier. That's the delta function I'm implementing order by order by adding appropriate green Schwartz counter terms here. And after you implement it as a Lagrange multiplier, as a beta, as a delta function, as a field, you get this. And here, because I don't have any fermions, you get directly an action, which represents the dual of the torsion, which classically, if you, before integrating out the H, you get this, and, and you get this result. And these are total derivatives if the action is constant. That's the standard shift symmetry of the action. So you see that the action is dual to the totally antisymmetric H torsion, which is the field strength of the, the modified field strength of the spin one tensor. If you couple to fermions, you can show that the action couples to the axial current, but the derivative of the action. An action always has a shift symmetry, and that's the torsion. This is what I so, said before. Yes? Um, you have about five more minutes? Oh, yes, that, that's fine. Okay. Now, let me then so this is the model that I will consider. This vanishes, in fact. And these are the repulsive interactions that I mentioned earlier. So let me go to the torsional invariants. 
and uh, and uh, very quickly. And why? How? Because this is a talk about across approaches and how I arrive at the Lorentz violation. First of all, you know that if torsion is present, the whole section can be non-trivial. You have the coefficient here, which is connected to, the, in the Azteca formalism, this is purely imaginary, is, is connected to the standard SO31 connection, or in the Barbero formalism, if the beta is real and is connected to its double cover, there's two connection. If you do the analysis, which I don't have the time now, if you put this term in the presence of torsion, and that was considered by Friedel, Minich, and Takeuchi first, and then Perez and Rovelli, uh, you get this arbitrary coefficient, which before we didn't, because before we had we were in the limit of beta going to infinity. However, as noticed by Mercury, if beta is constant and is not a field, this is not consistent because you, you when you do the analysis, you arrive at the fact that the vector is pro actually is proportional to an axial current. Uh, so this something should should be happening. This is what Mercury did to cure the problem. He considered non-minimal coupling to fermions with this parameter, and then you say that the problem is cured if alpha equals beta. And uh, this the important point of Mercury was that he considered the topological invariance. He said the whole structure alone is not an invariant, so that's the density uh, that he considered. And then he considers a uh, restricted torsion to find it. However, you notice that this inconsistent, if you make beta pseudoscalar, i.e. the constant, the verb of a field, then you cure the problem. And uh, in that particular case, you can even consider minimal couplings uh, of, of this field. But the four fermion interactions, in, if you consider non-minimal couplings, become also in addition to the repulsive ones. This is the actual uh, repulsive interaction that I was writing before. You could even have, depending on the signature of this coefficient of the gamma, which is the, the gamma is the, one over beta here, you can get the, and, and, and as a field, you can get even attractive interactions. Now in string theory, you notice that this ni yan invariant is nothing other but that our uh, string tension. That's exactly what it is. However, in, in the string theory, we also have the torsion chern simons term as I argued before because of the anomaly. Now let me in the last three minutes, if I can take, uh, how this can lead to Lorentz violation, very quickly. So the anomalies, first of all, I will go quick. Unlike the gauge field, which is topological and does not contribute to the stress tensor, the anomalies does contribute to the cotton tensor, to the stress tensor, and in fact, leads to positive, uh, non-positive contribution. It leads, the anomaly leads to, uh, if you have matter here, and for us, this matter would be the action field, would be non-conserved, the stress tensor in the presence of this torsion, because this term is not zero in general. And in order to have conservation, you have to restrict the backgrounds. However, you can always define an improved tensor and everything is fine. And this is still consistent with energy, uh, with diffeomorphism invariance, because you simply means that you have an exchange of energy between matter and gravity. Now, spontaneous Lorentz violation. What do I do? If I have non-trivial gravitational waves, I can have a condensate of this term, which could contribute to cosmological constant light terms. How? Like this. Uh, you consider gravitational wave perturbations. You integrate over momenta up to a given cutoff. So this is a quantum gravity calculation. And uh, if you assume that this B dot, which is the time derivative, if you assume that the action field, the torsion is only homogeneous and isotropic, and you can justify this, you get this equation, which because of this isotropy equation of anomaly, you get this. And at the end, you have this solution. You may assume inflation and then you get it naturally. If the age is constant, you can see that you can always arrange this exponent to be a constant upon this restriction. So you get a spontaneous Lorentz violating solution because of the condensate of the temporal component of the anomaly. All right? That's why B dot and then at the torsion is constant. This is actually the important point for my talk. So in this case, you consider a spontaneous Lorentz violating solution, uh, which you can parameterize with the Planck data. You can get inflation because you can show that the energy density of the inflation uh, has this form. You can get, despite the fact that the age depends mildly on time, you can get inflation, you can drive inflation. That's the, that I will skip, it's the RVM-like term. It is CP violation because you have the anomalous terms. The anomalous terms also contribute negative terms here, but it is CP violation. And the important point of this torsion is, and if I may have one minute, can I? 
Sure. Yes? Go, keep Good. going. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, the, why is important for matter and the matter assume? Now, why? Because I showed you how anomaly condensation of, from torsion uh, generated the uh, condensates. At the end of inflation, I can generate chiral matter. Chiral matter creates their own anomalies who cancel these anomalies except these chiral anomalies which can generate a potential for this action and can play a role of that matter. That's not important. What is important is that the equation of motion, once you have the exit of inflation, once you generate chiral anomalies, uh, you can see how this scales until today. And this is the important point, which I was saying earlier, this has that form of uh, CPT violation because it couples to the actual current. And if you calculate in a detailed way, taking into account temperature dependence of the chiral anomalies, cosmic electromagnetic fields, the value of this field, this is B dot. This is the action, uh, the, the constant one almost. It's not quite constant uh, at the exit of inflation, but today gets this value. And you see the values, the limits that you have in the standard model extension. Even if you consider boost from the Earth's velocity, you get you get this value. So leptogenesis is very easy because once you have this form at the exit of inflation and you have right hand in neutrinos in the presence of this background, which is slowly moving during the short period of leptogenesis, you can get the CPT violation. And the CPT violation means that the three level decay of the neutrinos are already proportional to be zero. They are not zero, unlike the standard CPT invariant that you need to go to loops. Well, this is the value. So you see that's the lepton asymmetry and then you communicate it to the standard biogenesis by the standard methods. So to conclude, as I said, I started from an anomalous gravitational theory which arises in the low energy limit of string theory. This is the whole. And we have shown that the torsion plays an important role in inducing an action, uh, is a generic fixture of torsional theories and actually leads to spontaneous Lorentz invariant and CPT violation, which could also play a role in, in a consistent cosmology, which I leave you uh, here. And uh, that's uh, the end of, of my talk, if you like. I mean, I can go on forever and tell you phenomenology, but because we exist of anomaly, because this constant background is associated with leptogenesis, if you have right hand in neutrinos, I am paraphrasing Carl Sagan here, and I say that we are anomalously made of star stuff. So that's my poetic end <laughs> of the talk. <laughs> and apologize if I, if I exceeded my time by. Uh, thank you. That was um, quite a lot. I'm already seeing the first hand up, but it's George again. Um, so I'm just going to. Do other Sorry. people have questions? Otherwise, yeah, I have, yeah. yeah I, have, I have to leave. So, so just a quick you comment. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Nikos, for this very nice talk. And the comment is actually maybe also relevant for Julia. So um, uh, the BMU new field, right? You presented a, a nice summary of uh, what is known and how it's related to axion and et cetera. But um, there is sort of a, a new twist that was realized by um, Laurent, myself and, and Rob Lee um, that essentially, if you try to implement relative locality in string theory, mm -hmm. then actually the BMU new field uh, can be absorbed into sort of a, um, a symplectic structure that usually does not appear in the ah, text. And you get the dilaton then from? Well, okay. So the dilaton has to do with the volume of, with the, the, right. of, the, of, the, of the, if you want, the phase space. But this guy has to do essentially with the symplectic structure which tells you that the left and right modes um, do ah. not commute. Okay. Uh, is that the, so, can you and, send and, me the, the paper? This is okay. Quite... I'll send you the reference, but it's also interesting for Julia because it's a model. Okay. I'm, yes, not, I'm not sure if it, if it fits into everything you want to do phenomenologically, both of you, but it's a, it's an implementation relative locality because you can actually uh, uh, rotate from the left and right, or if you want uh, space time, also... space time. Very good. Yeah. It might and also play a role in chiral anomalies that I was talking about. Maybe, maybe. I, you know, I don't know how phenomenologically sure. relevant it is, uh, but it, uh, also for Julia, it will be covariant. Um, yeah, uh, that's what I was going also. to ask. How, how can this be? It, it, is. it is interesting if you can make it. Uh, yeah, so so the, the, the point is that you see uh, in that case, because there is a fundamental scale, okay, essentially the size of the string. Uh, and you can also make it covariant. So fundamental time, fundamental scale. You see the different observers 
okay, would see different space times. Mm. So you see, that's why it's consistent with Lorentz. But, but how are they linked to the different observers? They are linked through a, a new geometric structure, which is quantum. It, it contains symplectic structure. That's where the B mu nu comes, okay? The double structure. So it's like you have a space time and a dual space time, kind of like a space is, space. And that and is independent of, of string theory, you say, in the model. Well, okay, so I, I would say string theory presents a model for this. And but and there is also a conformal structure, so sure. they call this Born geometry, okay? Because okay. Born uh, curve space time, mm -hmm. you know, curve phase space, uh, momentum space. Oh, yes, I space. remember your talk now. I remember that you gave it in okay. The anyway, I, I don't know how that relates to your um, phenomenology, but uh, and but I've I looked to it. it now I have, if you send me the email, the precise, although well. I can find it on the web, I remember your talk. Thanks very much, George. I, I will, I will. Okay, <laughs> I have to go and thank you so much, both of you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. So I'm seeing another hand up. Um, Thomas Love, if you want to ask your question. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Uh, Julia, Nick, lovely talks. Thanks, for thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, regarding Julia's talk uh, when you said that you calculated uh, the influence of DSR on uh, synchrotron radiation. So I was wondering whether something similar can be done. Uh, first of all, why you can do that in DSR? And secondly, uh, I was wondering what, whether something similar can be done for some, let's say, uh, simple, more simple processes like uh, photon decay or something like that. This one has only one vertex. So maybe you could avoid there uh, this problem of two vertices and causality. Thank you. Yeah, um, so concerning the synchrotron, um, the analysis there is only kinematical in some sense. So you're not doing the dynamics that, that brings you to produce the synchrotron radiation. You're just saying, okay, let's say that the dynamics is the usual one because that's what we can do. And we, only, we are only concerned about what happens when then I do the computation in the reference frame of the electron and then I go to the reference frame of the of the laboratory. So, because in in the SR we are, we still do not know how to do the dynamics. So that part we assume it stays as it is, which is I mean we wanted to do a similar analysis to the one that was done in the in the leave uh, framework. So also there you you take for granted the radiated power in in the reference frame of the electron. And then you move to the uh, reference frame of the laboratory and see what you would see there. And this is what I am comparing. I am comparing what happens when you move to one reference frame to the other reference frame. And in one case, you get this uh, big amplification factor that is uh, the gamma factor squared. And the, in the other case, you don't get it. So that, that's, uh, that's where the, the modifications enter only. Then, then in principle, yeah, you could think about modifications at the level of the dynamics, but there, because the energies are not so high, I mean, you would not expect them to be that relevant in that specific. Uh, so you can quite safely assume that, that you can approximate them as, uh, as usual. So this is the first part. And uh, what was the second part? Uh, the second part was um, in LIV, uh, there is this possibility of photon decay, which is rather simple process, ah, yeah. only one vertex. So what about that in DSR? Yeah, no, as I was uh, saying, for photon decay specifically, you do not expect it to, to happen at all, just because that would be introducing a reference frame, which is the frame where the photon has the threshold ah. energy. Right. So an observer that sees that photon with the energy above the, the threshold would see the decay. An observer with the that sees the photon with the energy below the threshold would not see the decay. So it, this would be introducing a, a preferred frame or a preferred observer. So in, in that case, you don't, uh, you, you say, you know that it cannot happen. It is interesting that in uh, live, in principle, so kinematically the process is allowed because there you can introduce it um, the preferred frame, so you can do this threshold analysis. Mm -hmm. But then there, the dynamics enters. So you, you would still need to check whether, so the process is allowed kinematically, but it would still be forbidden dynamically because mm -hmm. there could be 
some other interaction or symmetry or whatever that forbids photon decays anyways. Uh, but for that part, you need to, to have the full framework. For example, you can do this computation in the uh, standard model extension theory. Maybe Nick uh, can comment on this. And then you would be able to say whether this could happen or not at all. You mean the, the photon decay, you mean? Yeah. Uh, it depends. I mean, it depends on what the higher derivative theory is, because you, yeah, exactly. you can, I mean, in my theory, for instance, there is no photon decay. If you have only the fermions, then everything is fine. You know, it depends on what, what is the theory of the standard model extension that you are considering, because standard model extension has many parameters. For me, it's just the fermions. You don't, you don't, you know, it doesn't. But, you so have concerning this, what, what would you be saying about the neutrino? That it can uh, decay, it can, uh, uh, you know, the right hander, for instance. Uh, yeah, so you, you would know, have different. Uh... Yeah, the, the neutrino behaves in exactly the same way if you have torsion. Always couples to the axial current because the axial current is universal, couples to all the species, electrons, neutrinos, protons. And it's, uh, if there is chiral, and it is in the standard model, then you have anomalies. If it is non chiral, if, if the right handed cancels exactly the left hand, and then you don't. But of course, the chiral, uh, standard model is chiral, so you, you, you have the anomalies, but it doesn't have any other, it can produce leptogenesis in this way. That's the only difference. I mean, it's important difference because it produces at three level. The decay of the right hand neutrino to standard model particles is different from the decay to the antiparticles because of this background, of the torsion background. That's that's what I found interesting. That at least mm -hmm. you get the standard model extension, and but you get it from geometrical. Uh, it has geometrical origin. Uh, torsion is a geometry, so condenses. But and that's a spontaneous violation of Lorentz symmetry. It's not. Uh... Of course, in the theory that George, I had to look at it with a relative locality is different. Eh? I mean, it's uh... yeah. In principle, there that, 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 that I don't know. Yeah. To me, I con I link it to the Barbero Emilci field, if you like, in the other approach. The, the so, so it, actually, talking. speaking of this, it is interesting that, uh, so you mentioned this uh, LQG mm -hmm. uh, framework, uh, and uh, it is interesting because uh, it, the way you look at it, uh, it would seem that uh, you're actually introducing a preferred uh, a, a background there, right? If you, have the, if you have the condensate. You may not have a condensate. Yeah, that's the point. Because uh, the on the other hand, we have these results. You don't have to have a condensate uh, of gravitational waves. In LQG, uh, you might have, in, at least yeah. in some limits, uh, a deformed. Yeah, yeah. So the theory uh, is so It really depends on. Uh, yeah. It really depends on, on the regime or what you put into it somehow. What conditions? Is the landscape yeah. of string theory? You see, it's the same. It's a vacu one vacuum breaks the Lorentz symmetry, the mm -hmm. others don't. You know, it depends on what conditions. I mean, I described conditions, I didn't have the time to go through details, that there exists condensation of gravitational waves. You need to have primordial gravitational waves, otherwise you don't have it. You need to have CP violation. So Zakharov is right. <laughs> I mean, you see, Zakharov postulated that you need the CP violation. This theory also mm -hmm. makes a different use of it. Zakharov assumed that you have CPT, of course, huh? that you assume that... Uh, we don't. You, you only have CP. You only have CP. Yeah. We have both. Sorry, Sorry can I can I jump in because I had another question, <laughs> <laughs> and that's um, so if you if you assume that your theory um, that violates Lorentz violations may it be quantum gravity or not, mm -hmm. um, if, if that couples everything at that scale, yeah. Um, so then the Lorentz violations, you would expect them to pop up in all of the different sectors. Of in the all the fermion sectors, or not, not gauge, not gauge sector. Gauge sector didn't couple to torsion. You see, that's the point. The question is, what is the F mu nu? The F mu nu, how do you define it in the theory of torsion? In some theory, is defined with the ordinary derivative, covariate derivative. So the spin connection drops out of the field strength. Uh, so the gauge sector, this theory couples only to fermions, and it's universal. It couples, to, so you can see it in electrons, but you see the numbers. 10 to the minus uh, 44 milli electron volts. Do you see what I mean? You will never detect it in, in an atomic physics experiment. Still, the my moment. question would be in, in which of the sectors would you would you then Fermions. expect experimentally to first see? Fermions. 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 The same thing with electric dipole moments. You know, they will show up in electric dipole moments. In Is the fermion part is... is uh, uh, 
Can I share again quickly my? Yes, please go ahead. Just to show yes. the to answer Aaron. Sorry. So it's here in my beginning where I mention uh, where is it here? So this sector, the 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 Fermion. And and this is non-specific, right? This is for any torsion. This is uh, any any. I mean, this is of course a standard model extension. It could be any field. For the torsion, the torsion couples universally to all the to all the fermion species because of geometry. So torsion couples to the axial current in a generic theory. I'll show you here. Here, so you see, uh, if it is the axial, this okay. I assume one fermion, but I could sum up overall fermions. Psi i psi i psi i. And that's that's what happens in the string theory model, for instance. It couples here to let's show you here. So it's universal in this sense. You see, this is the actual current, all all the all including the right handed neutrinos, whatever your theory has. Okay, thanks. That's the and that's why it's fermions, not not gauge. Uh, they may be, as I said, usually the st string theory doesn't give torsion to the gauge, to the to the gauge field. You can add counterterms and remove it. Other theories might, but I think also the loop quantum gravity doesn't, uh, in my opinion. All I, I was trying to say is that if you promote the Barbero Imirci parameter to a field, which you have to, otherwise it appears inconsistent because of this improper Lorentz transformation properties, and then you you get similar uh, role as the as the as the action which is associated with torsion, which I find it interesting. All it mean it might mean is that the low energy limit of gravity torsion unifies the theories. You see, that could be the case. Mm -hmm. I propose so non-Riemannian geometry. Uh, that's... I propose loop quantum gravity. Sebastian has raised his hand. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, we said the critical yeah. word. <laughs> it's that's it's an intriguing the... question. It's an intriguing question. Like, um, I mean. But what you described as like, um, you know, promoting the barrier music parameter to a field is typically not what one does in LQG. Um, and of course. you just look at pure gravity and then you quantize in one way or another. And um, just what I wanted to, to mention is that at least in spin form models, it seems to be, or, you know, um, I think we are starting, we are, we're starting to understand that we will probably will be summing over non metric, non metricity. That's right. That's well. a different uh, approach, as I said. You may define the non-metricity scala, which means the covariant derivative instead of the dual. I, I define the dual tensor. So the S mu was the dual to the to the torsion tension. Mm. Okay. Then that arises necessarily in string theory. In string theory, I cannot avoid this action. It's there because of this constraint. In your uh, loop quantum gravity, you may define uh, the FQ gravity, for instance, the, the Q, the, the non-metricity scala, which stems is a particular combination of the covariant derivative of the Jimmy Nu field. Mm -hmm. That scala is another degree of freedom, but that depends on the metric. Me, the action depends only on torsion, only on topology. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean of course, we have like many steps to do because of course, um, my question to you to as experts on loop quantum gravity is what happens if you put torsion? That's the question. Yeah, that's what I'm what I'm trying to say is like that we might that we might just automatically get torsion. We have to understand it better, but we might get torsion to some extent. And there has been recently a work by Bianca Dittrich where she like looked at uh, you know basically. Uh, looking at some effective spin for model perturbed around some uh -huh. background. That would be interesting. There, you are getting, you know, um, something which looks like gravitons, but also massive degrees of freedom. So actually quite massive degrees of freedom. If it is, ma to me, there is one massive degree of freedom, the SMSM. You see, this dual term is quadratic. You see, if I can share again, can I share again? Sorry. How much time do we have to... <laughs> Because I can talk forever. Time, I, think. <laughs> I can talk forever, but uh, it's Friday afternoon, so it's a Very discussion nice. session. I think <laughs> people just slip away whenever they've had enough. Before okay, everyone good. slips away, let me just do the quick announcement <laughs> that there will be more talks in the season. Um, the next talk will be on effective field theories and the swamp plant. 
Um, for that, we have invited Scott Melville and Irene Valenzuela. And um, we haven't fixed the date yet, but it will likely be in January and not in December, just because we don't want to compress everything before Christmas. So um, after this announcement, please, Nick, go ahead, explain. Okay. Explain so, to us. Thank you. You will send again the announcement, I suppose, through the Slack of channel course. on the talks. And very good. Very there good. will be plenty of announcements and reminders. Very just good. Thank you. So if I may share about this question on the massive mode, you see, here is the point. There is a massive mode here, all right, in the uh, SS. That's the dual. That's like a mass. And of course, always, because of this constraint, in the if you, if you make it as a torsion, you always have this. And that's how this corresponds to a quantum torsion to, to, to the action. Now, if you do that in the loop quantum gravity, with the Barbero Mirchi parameter as a as a non uh, not as a field, you get this. You see that was what uh, Simone Mercuri did. You add the holes. That's what uh, actually Friedel, uh, George, and Takeuchi did, and then Perez and Rovelli. You add the holes. And that's a Barbero Mirchi here. You add this action, which is vanishing if you don't have torsion. But then when you split, when you put fermions. So in a pure quantum gravity, you're not going to see any problem. Once you put fermions is the problem. Once you put fermions, you will see that when you analyze the torsion into each uh, vector, that's the T, that's the torsion is TR mu mu. So you contract the two indices of the torsion. That's the torsion vector. Then you see that you have this relation. And this relation is inconsistent because that's an axial current, psi bar gamma mu gamma five psi. So it changes the sign under reflection. But this doesn't because it's a vector. And that's what Mercury had to go and do with this thing and constrain to say, OK, I have some theories where I don't have this. But that's not the problem. The problem is that this is not actually change the sign. Uh, that's what you, I, I call it as a field. It's like an action field. Change the sign uh, under, uh, under, uh, uh, under reflection. That's the point. So maybe you cannot have, Bianca is probably doing it without fermions. Am I right? Yes, it's without fermions. That's right. Without That's fermions, you're not going to see kind of any problems. problems. Try to put fermions. And I, I bet... <laughs> well, try to put matter in there. So. <laughs> well, you can do yes. it over the weekend. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's not easy. I but, think Sebastian has that covered. He's starting on the matter now. Very good. Yeah. But that's the point. Once you put fermions, then you start seeing the problem. Of course, I've seen it in a much easier way because I'm looking at very low energy continuous theory. So I by no means claim that I have an understanding. But maybe the low energy theories, these problems unify the approaches. That's what I've noticed. I noticed that if you promote it, the Barbero image is a field, and you have to within the context of the low energy theory, you get the same thing as the action of the string, as the BMU, the dual of that. That's that, that's what I chose this talk because you are doing quantum gravity across approaches. So maybe there are some common things. Mm -hmm. Plus the Lorentz violation that relates to Julia, of course. Great, thank you. So it's the matter actually. Matter matters. That's that's what I say. Torsion <laughs> matters. <laughs> Okay, I think we have now connected to every possible topic in the area. Or well, no, gravity is supposed to do that. The problem is, what is it, what is it going to solve? <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? There is still some audience left, so maybe if you have burning questions, now it's the time. If there are no more burning questions, I think... It is Friday, so um, thank you very much for these very interesting talks. There was certainly a lot in there, and um, I have my work cut out thinking about it all. So thank you, and thank have you. a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you very much you too. For, for your invitation. And thank have you, a nice Julia. weekend to everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.